Genesis chapter 1, and if you would stand with me as we read the Word of God, if you're able to. Genesis chapter number 1, and we'll start in verse number 26, and we'll read verse 27 as well. The Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Before I get into the message, let's pray, and then you may be seated. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would be with me now as I speak. I ask that you'd speak through me, help me to use my words wisely, I say. I would bring honor to you and that you would be glorified through this and that we would learn something from your word tonight. And I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. So we see here and we catch ourselves, we find ourselves in the midst of the creation story. God has created the fish, the fowl, the beast of the field. God says to himself, the Trinity, saying... He looks at each other. I don't know how you do that as the Trinity. He says, let us make man in our image. Now, he created the fish, and he made the fish. He spoke him. He created the birds, and he said, there goes the birds flying off into the air, and the sparrow. And he created the beast of the field, and there that was the beast of the field. He spoke, and the stars were in existence. He spoke, and the firmament and the waters were there. But man was different. Man he created by, the, by his finger. By the dust of the ground, he drew man up. And he said, I don't want man to be like the beast. I don't want man to be like the animal. I want man to be different. I want to be able to commune with him. And I want to, to and have a relationship with me. So let us create man in our image. Let's make them in the image of God like we are. And so he created man, he drew him in the dust of the ground and breathed into them the breath of the life. But after he created man, man was there and in the garden he put him. And while he's in the garden there, he got a little lonely. Just like, you know, most of y'all are married in here. You got a little lonely when you became adults and you desired to have a lady. And you got married and you got a wife. Adam was lonely. He saw the beast of the field and the fish and the fowl. And he said, they have, in his mind, he might have said, they have someone. You know, maybe he thought to himself, why can't I have someone? He saw the, the bears. They had a mate. And he saw the skunks in February here. They had a mate. And, you know, <laughs> they stink up the road. I tell you what, when they get hit, they have to find new mate fast. But anyway, <laughs> so... They, they had a mate, and Adam desired a mate. So God put him in a deep sleep, and he made Eve. That's not the point I'm getting at, but as time goes by, the whole garden was given to them, Adam and Eve. He gave them the whole garden. He said, lack one thing. He said, you cannot have of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can have every tree in the garden. You can have every fruit. You can have every herb. You can have everything in this garden except that one tree. Stay away from that one tree. So Adam and Eve, they go about their day. But as we know, the serpent was more subtle than any other. And in Genesis 3, we find that the woman gets deceived, brings to the man, and the man falls in sin as well. And God cast them out of the Garden of Eden. But what I want to point out from this is God created man in his image. And he created man not just to be like the, the, the beast of the field and just to live and to eat and to sleep and to use the restroom and die. He did not create us to just do that. God created man because he wanted a fellowship with us. He wanted to have a relationship with man, so he created us, and he created us in his image, and he wanted to talk with us. As you see in Genesis, he goes throughout the garden. He has conversations with Adam and, and conversations with Eve. And I want to point out 
how God has tried to restore this relationship through the Holy Spirit, through the love of Christ, and through God's love himself, through the Father's love. We see the Holy Spirit, the way that he tries to restore it is then the Holy Spirit is the comforter. The comforter is the promised one that is on the leaving of Jesus Christ from earth. God said, I will not leave you comfortless. And he gives us the comforter in John chapter 14, verse number 16. If you take your Bibles there, go over to John chapter 14, verse number 16. It says, John 14, 16, and I will give and I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter. That, ye may abi- that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. So we know that upon salvation, we get the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwells us, and that Holy Spirit... In the biblical comparison in the relationships of family has always been the wife. Because, guys, we know we cannot comfort no one. (laughs) We are hard-headed and hard-hearted sometimes. And, Mom, if you scraped your knee at home and you hurt yourself, was Dad going to be the one running to you? No. It was going to be Mom, right? And the Holy Spirit has always been... That, that woman, not the woman, he's not a female, he's not a woman, but he's been that, that, that compassionate type, as in the family. The male is the head, like Christ is the head of the church, but the female has always been the Holy Spirit in the home, you know, the one that keeps the peace, you know, that keeps your kids from killing each other and keeps, you know, dad from killing the kids, wanting to spank him and, you know, all that kinds of stuff. So, he is the comforter. But he's not only the comforter. In John chapter 14, verse number 26, God gave the Holy Spirit to us to comfort and to help us grow closer to God the Father. How? how? By helping us learn. He is our teacher and the one who helps us remember all things. It says here in John 14, 26, the Bible says, But the comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, Jesus is leaving the earth. He's about to go up into heaven in a, few, in a little while. And he says, I will not leave you comfortless. You're not going to be here because I'm sure they were worried. They're going to be like, Jesus, what are we going to do? You're going to be gone. What's going to happen? You're not going to be here to teach us. So Jesus tells them, hey, when I leave, I'm going to have the Father. I'm going to pray the Father, and he's going to send the Holy Spirit down to be a comfort, but not only a comfort, but to teach you, to teach you in the way of the things that I have taught you as well, and to bring into remembrance the things that I have taught you. And where do we find that? But the Word of God. So when we read the Word of God, we should ask the Holy Spirit to help us, teach us. Now, have you ever heard of a time that you've done something and the Holy Spirit's pricked your heart? And you knew that you should have done it or you should have not done it. One or the other. You know, you should have passed out that track or you shouldn't have, you know, kicked your brother. And the Holy Spirit, or your mom, (laughs) said, hey, go to your room. Anything like that. So the Holy Spirit is that person that's going to prick your heart as well. He's there for conviction, for comfort, and for teaching. He's not there just for some spooky sensation to speak in tongues or, or any sort of thing like that. The Holy Spirit is there for comfort. Conviction is to help us to bring to salvation as well. He is our educator and comforter. The Holy Spirit is our comforter and educator for he would not love us. If he left us ignorant. Now God is trying to restore the relationship with man. That was broken in the garden. He gave us his son. He gives us the Holy Spirit to comfort us. To teach us. To bring us to the teachings of what Jesus Christ had taught us in the Bible here. And to bring us closer to him. And to to convict our hearts when the preacher preaches. 
And when, when you read in your Bible and he says, hey, you know, you should probably start acting that out in your life. Or he says, hey, you know, you need to remove that in your life. And the Holy Spirit starts poking at you and, and he teaches you and he comforts you. And he brings into remembrance maybe when you go home and the preacher had said something. You go home and you start to do something and you remember, hey. The preacher said in the word that I should not start be doing that because it's going to ruin my relationship with God. Now we come to the Holy Spirit's the comforter and the love of Christ. God's son loved us so much that he came from heaven to die on the cross. The son of God paid the ultimate sacrifice. He gave his own life on Calvary for us shedding his blood and being separated from the fellowship of his father. Jesus did not die because he felt like he wanted to. In the garden, the day before, he wept blood drops of tears. He wept, he wept tear drops of blood. That's some pretty serious agony. That's some pretty serious prayer. That's some pretty serious... Uh, prayer to the Father, trying to say, Father, let this cup pass from me if thy will, if it is your will. But if not, hey, I'm going to go to the cross. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice, trying to restore us with the, with the relationship of God because we were not a child of God until we came to salvation. So we see that the restoring of the relationship happens through the redemption of Jesus Christ's blood. And then the Holy Spirit comes in and he teaches us what, the, what Jesus Christ has taught the disciples and taught the apostles throughout the whole time he was on the ministry. And then what God told Moses, he wrote in the book as well. And he brings to remembrance these things, trying to teach us. And this is all to restore a relationship with God. Jesus died on the cross, gave himself for us, but even greater than that is the love of the Father. The Bible tells us in Romans 5, 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God commendeth. That word is like another word for God showed his love toward me and you. And that while we were yet sinners, while we were sinners on our way to that place called hell, deserving the place called hell, he sent his son. Now, there's quite a few parents in here. I would like you to imagine that you had one son, and only one son, and that son was very dear and very precious to you. Would you give that son to die for an alcoholic or a druggie? or a murderer, or a thief. God loved us so much, He gave His Son to die for us so we could have that relationship back with Him like we had in the garden when Adam was created for that relationship for, with God. We were created to show our love to God and have a relationship with God, and the devil is going to always try and distract us from that. He's always going to try and put something in the way, put something in the past. The love of the Father, we have come now to the one who is our Heavenly Father. He needs not bow to any. He needs not ask bread from any. He is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. The one who we can cast our prayers upon. He gave His Son to die for us. He seeks a relationship with us. God has shown His love through many avenues. He's shown His love through His creation made for us to marvel and wonder at His majesty. He's made the heavens to look upon and to wonder how He made them just by speaking in His power and how wonderful He is. Just by speaking, He made the stars and the sun to set in the places where they are just at the right spot to keep the earth warm enough and not too cold but not too hot. He just spoke. This is the Heavenly Father. And He prepared for those who love Him wonders to behold in heaven in 1 Corinthians. He says to those who love Him, He said, I prepared wonders and many marvelous things for those who love Me. He says, And yet, we as the creation push Him away. 
we find in the Bible God desiring his creation. The creator seeking the creation for fellowship. If you go to Genesis chapter 3, verse number 9. Genesis chapter 3, verse number 9. Like we said, Adam was, Adam was created and man was created for fellowship and a relationship with God. And he, he wanted us to have a close walk with him. And now Adam is sinned. They're cast out. Adam is sinned. And God comes to him in the garden. It's all just happened. The sins just happened. Adam's just ate. And now the Lord is calling. At chap Genesis chapter 3, verse number 9. The Bible says, And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? We find here the Creator seeking the creation. God calling and seeking for Adam in the garden. God did not need to do that. God knew where Adam was. God's omnip omniscient. He's omnipresent. And he's omnipotent. He does not need to be like, I wonder where Adam is in the garden today. I think he's over here in this corner. Let me call for him. No, God was calling Adam to help him realize that his relationship had just been broken. And what does it say in verse 10? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. He had known that his relationship, he knew that he had just disobeyed God, so he had hid from God. God shows his love toward us by giving his son Trying to, trying to restore this relationship, gives us the Holy Spirit to comfort us and bring us closer to Him and to convict us in the sermons and in His Word and through His teachings in the Bible, and we push Him away. And we try to hide from it. And try to say, no, God, I, I, I know a little better than you because I'm, I'm a man, right? You, you created me, but I know better than you. This is where Adam is. He says, I was naked and afraid. I hid myself. I was hiding from you. The worst thing we can do when we get in sin and when we go and disobey the word of God and disobey the teachings of God and get into sin, the worst thing we can do is to run from the face of God. The best thing you can do to restore your relationship with God, restore your relationship with the Heavenly Father like He wanted us to. As He did in the Garden of Eden, He created us to have a relationship with Him and to walk with Him and to know Him. But then we sinned, and now we're destined to hell. So He sends His Son to die on the cross for us to be the propitiation and the redemption through His blood for our sins. Then He gives us the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to teach us and to draw us closer to God and to teach us in the way that Jesus Christ had taught His disciples and apostles, and then we sin and we say, you know what? I don't need the Holy Spirit. I don't need any of that. I need to hide because I just did something wrong. Y'all have any kids that I haven't, I don't have kids. I don't know this, but I, I've worked on a bus and I, I know a little bit of little kids. And, and when you have a kid, when they know they've done wrong, where do they go? They go to their room. They go somewhere to hide. Somewhere away from mom and dad so that they can't be found. Right? I don't want mom and dad to find out what it was. For me, it was pepperonis. I was a pepperoni thief. I'm, I admit it. I'm sorry, Lord. But anyways, and um, so <laughs> that got me off track. At night, my parents would go to bed, Right? They would go to sleep, and my room was here, the kitchen's in front of my room. And my parents' room is, you know, a little bit across the house a little bit. And I would get up at night, and I would sneak out in the kitchen. It's all dark. I mean, it's dark in West Virginia. When those hills cover the, you know, it's, it's dark. And I open that fridge, and you know what? That fridge was against me. That thing had a light in it. And I open that door, that light shines out, and I go in there and get pepperonis and shut the door. 
And you know, about five minutes later, you know who comes in my room? The Holy Spirit, my mom. No. <laughs> and she says with a nice, soft, sweet voice, Paul, were you in the fridge? No. I was not in the fridge. No way. There's no way I was in the fridge. Mom, what do you mean? Under the pillow. Paul, lift up the pillow. Yep, yep. I'm sorry, Mom. She's like, you know, if you would have just told me at first that you had stole those out of the refrigerator, your punishment wouldn't have been as bad. That was always something my mom and dad did. If I ever did something wrong, if I had come to them and said, you know what, I just hit my sister. And if I told them that, they would, they would say, okay, you're going to get a spanking, but you knew you did wrong, and that's good, but you're not going to get as harsh as spanking. And that's the same way with the Heavenly Father. When we do something wrong, God would rather us to restore that relationship because before, if I had tried to hide it from my parents, I would have kept avoiding them and I would have kept staying away from them. I would have got farther away from them and, and you know, maybe tried to hide out in the barn in the back and, and try to stay away from them because I knew correction and punishment was coming and I would try to avoid them. And that's what we do as Christians. When we sin, we try to avoid God and we try to stay away from God. Instead of, and like when I was a kid, instead of if I would have went to my parents, got the spank and got it over with, and the relationship with my parents was restored. The same thing with us as Christians. We go back to God. We ask his forgiveness and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I love you. I want that relationship back. Will you forgive me? And God does. Our Heavenly Father is the same way as you parents or as my parents when it comes to knowing you love Him when you keep His commandments. You know, parents, there's nothing greater than when your children obey you, right? When your children obey you, it's the most wonderful thing in the whole wide world. I, I believe it because when I was on bus and those City kids didn't obey me. I wanted, to, mm, I wanted to let them have it. I'm like, you are going to obey me. My, you better be glad you weren't my dad's kid. You just better be glad you weren't my dad's kid. And anyway, when your child obeys you, it makes you happy. They realize that you love, they love you when they obey you. When they disobey you, it disappoints you, right? When they disobey you, it, it makes you sad. Because then you got to correct it. And then it's a whole deal. And you got to get in the works and the teaching of saying, hey, this is why this is wrong, and this is wrong because of. And that now I have to correct you because the Bible says it's wrong, and God says it's wrong, and you have to get into the whole that ordeal. But instead, if the child would have just obeyed, you could have avoided all of that. Now, God is the same way. He has created us. For a relationship with Him, our Heavenly Father, knowing you love Him, when you keep, your, keep His commandments, it says so in John 14, verse 15, He says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And God in heaven desires you to be in sweet fellowship with Him as He created us for that sweet fellowship. But there is a devil that walketh about seeking whom he may devour, trying to break down the sweet fellowship between us and God. Just like he was in the Garden of Eden, he always have wanted to exalt himself above God, but you know what makes God happy? Is that when you obey him, and when you praise him, and show him love, just like you would with your kids, and God loves that. And the devil seeks to do one thing, to break that fellowship with God, to get you starting to love something else instead of loving God and putting him first and, to, and to having his desires be your desires and his wants be your wants and his commandments be your will. He wants to break that fellowship by sliding in some sin and trying to break that fellowship with him because... That's his goal. 
Because he desires God to not be happy. And him making God not happy is through us. Because what makes God happy is when we have sweet fellowship with him. And the devil, he wants to put things in your life. It may not be something super sinful. It may be football. It may be basketball. It may be baseball. It may be a hobby. Something that will keep you from doing what God wants you to do. Whether it's being at church. I know this is Wednesday night, but everybody's here. But whether it's being faithful or whether it's trying to give your tithes or whether it's anything. Whether it's even getting up in the morning and reading your Bible and, and having a sweet talk with Him as you pray. The devil wants to put something in there to consume your time. Maybe that would take away the time that you could walk with God and pray to God and read His Word and get to know Him better. The devil is a master. He's had 6,000 years. And we have cell phones. I mean, YouTube shorts, anything. He'll give you 45 seconds. You know, you start watching those YouTube shorts, you realize you've been on there for 30 minutes after a 45-minute video. 45 second video and you he'll put anything on the cell phone he'll put family members he'll put anything in the way to try and try and keep your fellowship with God because that's what makes the devil happy because what makes God happy is you communing with him you talking with him you reading his word and you being in fellowship with him like you were created like we were created to be in sweet fellowship with God that's what God wants. And that's how, why he gave his son so that we could have that relationship to restore that relationship and gave us the Holy Spirit so that we can learn how to have that relationship. But there's the devil, like in Genesis chapter 3, who's going to say, you know what? God just doesn't want you to be happy. You know what? That tree... You know why you shouldn't eat that tree, God said? Because you'll be as smart as he is. You'll have the knowledge of good and evil, just like God. And the devil will slip in little things in our lives. Here and there, a little sin, a little hobby that keeps us from worshiping and serving God. A little this. It could be even work. A little that to keep us from our relationship with our Father. I had a bus kid come up to me one day after it was Sunday school, and I'm getting ready to close. I had a bus kid come up to me one day, and he asked me, he said, Brother Paul, why did God give them the perfect Garden of Eden and put a tree in there that they could mess up with? He said, that don't make sense to me. God made a perfect world, and he had a perfect man, and he had everything perfect, but he put one thing in there that could mess it all up. And he made the devil. Why did he make the devil, God, Brother Paul? Why did he make the devil? And I told him, and I'm not nobody smart, but I realized that God wants us to choose to obey him and choose to love him. Because if we... You know, AI and robots is all a thing. If they do everything you commanded, you don't feel no love from your cell phone. You don't feel no love from a robot. But when your child chooses to please you, boy, that makes your heart swell up. Boy, that makes you happy, right? The same with God. He wanted us to choose Him over everything else. He wants us to choose Him over anything else. Choose Him and a walk with Him and a sweet fellowship with Him like we were created for so that He can be happy and He knows that we love Him because He first loved us. This is what we were created for. God created us so that we would have a sweet relationship with Him. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would be with us as we go into the invitation now. Lord, I ask that you would be with me as well as I'm learning and I'm growing as well. 
ask that you would help me to realize that what you really want is a relationship with me and a relationship of, of me desiring you as well. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, as the pianos plays, you can come to the altar. Is there something keeping you from a relationship with God? Is there something keeping you from sweet fellowship with God?